Welcome to Spooky History. Today we're learning about Charles Dickens' own paranormal experiences. From childhood, Charles Dickens had a fascination for ghosts. For more on that, you can check out our previous episode on the women who inspired true horror. Or you can just take my word for it. As an adult, Dickens would pen many stories now considered classics, including the ghostly masterpieces A Christmas Carol and The Signalman. He was fascinated by the occult, both personally and as a businessman who knew what sold. He once wrote, my own mind is perfectly unprejudiced and impressionable on the subject of ghosts. I do not in the least pretend such things cannot be." And Dickens had his own brushes with the unexplained to go with that opinion. He claimed to have seen his dead and much-loved sister-in-law Mary in a night vision, and wrote of seeing his then still-living father by his bed before the latter disappeared when Dickens reached out to touch his shoulder. But Dickens' biggest personal brush with the paranormal would, fittingly enough, come via one of his ghost stories, albeit one of his lesser known ones. In 1861, Dickens was approaching 50 and was nine years away from his own death. His stories that dealt with the beyond were growing more serious, away from the parodies, romp and humour they had been in the Pickwick papers and closer to the foreboding fatalism of the signalman, but this story was still five years away though when Dickens published in September a piece in his All the Year Round magazine called Four Ghost Stories. As you can probably guess from the title, these were a collection of four pieces which were only a few pages long, put together into something more substantive. The first of these stories featured a portrait painter called Mr H, who meets a beautiful young woman in a railway carriage. Learning of his trade, she asks him if he could remember her face well enough to paint it from memory months later. The artist replied that he possibly could, but would much prefer conventional settings, which the young woman says would be impossible. In front of this obviously heartfelt request, he agrees and she gets off the train before him. The painter then arrives at his destination, where he is surprised to see and have dinner with the young lady yet again, though next day no one else has any recollection of having seen her there. Two years later, on another assignment, Mr H passes through a town he believes contains a friend called Mr Wilde, and sends him a note suggesting they meet up. The man who appears is Mr Wilde, but not the right one, and after the initial embarrassment, this Mr Wilde asks him to paint his daughter's portrait with one little catch. The daughter has been dead for two years, and he has no other likeness of her. After multiple disappointing attempts, the painter sketches the woman from the railway carriage. The father is chocked. It is the perfect likeness. What a twist. Fade to black. But the real twist came when Dickens received an angry letter from a miniature painter called Thomas Frank Heffy. Today, he is mostly remembered as the son of an artist the Tate and National Portrait Gallery still exhibit pictures by, but to Dickens, he was the man angrily asking how and why he had published under his own name a true story that had recently happened to him. Thomas Frank Heffy was Mr H, more than just name and he enclosed his own version of the event, which he had submitted to a rival publisher before Dickens' version had first appeared. Eeriest of all, Dickens had not only got the facts of the story and the protagonist's initials right, but even the exact date, the 13th of September, which Dickens had added in pencil in the margin of his own version at the last minute on a whim, or, as Dickens said, Now my story had no date, but seeing when I looked over the proofs, the great importance of having a date I wrote in unconsciously, the exact date on the margin of the proof. Why that date should have come into my head rather than any other, I am profoundly unable to say. The obvious answer, the one the painter instantly sprung to, is that Dickens must have plagiarised the story. One would expect Dickens to deny this, and he did, but far from trying to bury the original story as one might expect if he had stolen it, Dickens pronounced Heffy's version superior to his and tried to buy the rights to publish it in his own magazine. It is possible that this is a case of cryptonesia, or subconscious plagiarism, from a forgotten version of Heffy's story that Dickens had heard from a mutual friend. Dickens did like to write about those. Get it? <laughs> mutual friend? <laughs> Brilliant adaptation from the 90s, you should totally check it out. What do you do when you are confronted with the reality of your very own real-life ghost story? And what do you do when that story turns out to be better written than yours? To Charles Dickens, the answer was simple. Monetize it. One way or another. 
Dickens published an improved version of his story in the year round's October issue under the title The Portrait Painter's Story. This version does expand and add to Dickens first. The young lady is variously called the Lady of the Railway Carriage and the Lady in Black. Hmm. You know what? There's a good horror story in that. I wonder if Dickens came back as a ghost to kick himself when Susan Hill used it first. The painter also notes that it seems unlikely the lady could have arrived at the same house as him, considering he'd taken the shortest route and she hadn't, and remarks that he wished he had taken the same route as her. To which she replies, that would have been rather difficult. In this apparently true version of the story, nobody speaks to her at dinner, the painter assuming that this is because she must be the governess, and there is a third conversation when the lady in black visits him at home towards the end of a winter's day approaching Christmas. Hang on. This is the version Dickens didn't come up with. She asks him again about her portrait and if he has done anything about it. She is clearly desperate, and she has brought a print bearing the face of another lady, which she had previously shown him at the house, because she thought it might already provide him with a likeness. Moved, he tries to sketch her, but she keeps moving about, offering him only glimpses as he draws two quick drawings of her. Then she leaves, and the painter's servant claims all ignorance of his late visitor. Later it is Mr. Lute rather than Mr. Wilde who appears in place of the painter's acquaintance, and he has another daughter, who reveals her father has often been delusional and suicidal since her sister's death. She also mentions a print which she believes looks like her sister, but is much frustrated when she cannot find it. Later she recognises the one the painter had from the ghost as her missing print, and her father reveals he was anxious to hire him as he had during his delusional episodes, had visions of this stranger with his daughter in a railway a carriage, at a dinner, and in a crowd. The story ends, saying that with the final portrait the father's mental health was restored, so I guess the phrase is at least 150 years old. But life doesn't end as neatly as fiction. If it was plagiarism, Dickens used it to publicise the man he stole it from. If it was cryptonesia, Dickens' subconscious had an uncanny eye for detail. So what are the third alternative? that the lady herself had inspired a writer to immortalise her story from beyond the grave, just like she had inspired a painter to immortalise her appearance from beyond the grave. There was never any explanation of this mystery. Dickens insisted that he was completely innocent of plagiarism, deliberate or psychic. According to Forster, Dickens called the episode so very original, so very extraordinary, so very far beyond the version I have published that all other stories turn pale before it. Did he somehow hear a story a rival was printing a few months in the future and consciously or subconsciously use it first? Or was it aliens? Or ghosts? That would make more sense than aliens, I guess. Let us know what you think in the comments, though. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Spooky History. You can find us on most social media at Spooky His Show, and you can support us with donations at paypal.me forward slash noisy ghost ends. If you have suggestions for future episodes, leave them in the comments. Thanks for watching, and please, do have nightmares. Goodbye.